and your concepts and your pictures of Christ that you have. Uh, it may not be Ricky Bobby's version of Little Baby Jesus. Um, I hope it's not. I hope it is something much, much more than that because Scripture tells us uh, the many facets of our God. And, uh, and I want to challenge you with that tonight. And so because of that, I want to invite you to open up to 2 Timothy. And it's chapter 2. And where I want us to focus for tonight is verses 3 and 4. Paul is writing to Timothy. And he says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be like a sweet smelling fragrance to you. A worship of you through the word as I challenge and encourage us about what it means to be a good soldier for you. And it is in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, let's deal with the first part of this. I want to get it out of the way because it's an important part. But I don't know about you, but when anybody ever tells me, hey, calm down. It's not the first thing I want to do usually. Not at all. Tells me. Or they say, chill out. Oh, I'll chill out. <laughs> I got your chill right here. I, the human part of me, the fleshy part of me, is, that's the last thing I want to do. So Paul is telling Timothy, hey, hey, in military terms, pull out your military-issued straw and... Suck it up, mm -hmm. right? That's essentially what he's telling Timothy. Now, if that were somebody who had had similar experiences, kind of like we have similar experiences when we deploy with one another, so when someone says, hey, man, suck it up, we may at first blush say, really? Is that the best you got? Suck it up? But when it's a shared experience with somebody else, when we both are sharing in the same suffering, and that's what Paul is saying, he is not just saying, Timothy, suck it up. He's saying, Timothy, join with us as fellow sufferers and suck it up. He is saying <laughs> that there is similar suffering that we all experience. And because you are a follower of Christ, you need to join us in that. Now, we know that as deployed individuals, there's a certain amount of suffering that comes with deployment. Correct? There are noises. There are flavors. There are smells. There are experiences that are consistent with being deployed, and we share in them. Well, what Paul is trying to encourage Timothy is that as a believer in Christ, as a good soldier in Christ, there are similar sufferings that, they, that you are going to experience if you are focused on being a good soldier for Christ. Now, you may, as you sit here, I don't know where you're at as far as your military experience. I'm an active duty chaplain. I have been. I've reached the 10-year mark. And a lot of people will ask me, so I guess you're doing this, you're making this a career, right? And I always say to them, you know, we're going to do this as long as it's fun, which is kind of my cliquey way of saying as long as God has given me a passion for it. I firmly believe that I would not be happy doing anything else at this point in my life. God has called me to this place, he's called me to this ministry, he's called me to this service, and I must go and I must do it until he releases me from it. And so my wife and I joke, it's actually as long as my wife thinks it's fun, I believe we're both called to it. Because to, we're in this together. Amen. She's got to take care of my seven children while I am deployed. Yeah, I have seven children. Three boys and four girls. My oldest is a freshman in college. My youngest, I'm happy to say, is potty trained. So we together are in this. But you see, it's not about a retirement package. It's not about making rank. It's about as long as I am called to be in this service, that is where I will go. And it's not, believe me, there is that fleshy part of me that is like, I hope God wants me to do this for 20. That'd be nice. That'd be secure, right? That'd be nice to hand off. But I'll tell you, the greatest gift that God has given to me, other than the relationships that I have built with fellow believers and those that God has put on my heart to continue to pray for because they're not saved, is a, an example for living my life through the military. And I want you to bear with me a moment. As he talks about this, he says, look at this in verse 4. He says, no one serving as a soldier 
gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Now, I know all of you have a mission out here to accomplish, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. Our commander-in-chief has said, you will go forth and do great things for the Navy, for the Army, for the Air Force, the Marine Corps, wherever, whatever branch of service you happen to be called to, or the Coast Guard. Go forth and do great things. But there is a mission that you've been given to accomplish. Well, there is an even greater mission that God has given us as believers in Jesus Christ, which we are to accomplish. And the two are not separate from one another. In other words, you don't have this mission and this one, and never shall the twain meet. But in the context of the mission you have been given as a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coastie, in the context of that, God wants you to fulfill his mission. We have our commander-in-chief, but we have our commander in heaven who is commanding us to go forth like a good soldier and not get distracted by civilian things but stay focused on the mission that he has given us. What happens in the military when we lose focus on what the mission is, when we forget what we've been called to do, when we get distracted, if you will, by civilian affairs? We break the UCMJ, perhaps is the extreme example. What happens when we lose focus? The mission's not accomplished. The mission doesn't get accomplished. There's a danger. We depend on one another to the left and the right of us to help accomplish the mission. Whether you are a box kicker in the warehouse or you are putting bullets down range. Whether you are out winning hearts and minds on the streets of Djibouti or whether you are back here manning a skiff, processing information. Being a sailor, it seems like the people who have the hardest time with that are the people who wash clothes in the bowels of the ship. You sailors will know exactly what I'm talking about. That's the hardest place for people to really believe and understand that what they're doing is somehow a part of the mission. And we get like that sometimes as believers, don't we? Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for our worshipers up here. Thank you guys so much for leading us into the Holy Holies tonight. And they are a very visual example of the gifts that they are giving for the kingdom of God here in this place. But not all gifts are visual. And not all gifts do we see. And when you don't do what God has specifically trained and gifted you to do, what happens to the mission? Now God says the mission's going to go forward, whether you're on the train or not. The end of Luke, he says the message is going out. The message is starting in Jerusalem, it's going to go to Samaria and all the nations. And so we've got a choice to make as to whether or not we're going to be on the train or not. As we talk about being a good soldier for Christ... I want to challenge you about the mission that we have. He says we need to be focused. What is the mission? As you think about Christ, as you ask the question, why did Christ come? A lot of times we can get, we can get human focused in our ideas about why Christ came. We, we can think it was all for me. We can be focused on the fact that he came to save me. And in fact, John 3.16 is very clear, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And yet there is a much bigger picture than just our salvation. Although I am so grateful to God that our salvation is a part of that ultimate mission. It is a part of that ultimate mission. If you turn over to John 18.37, I want you to turn over there. Jesus talks about why it is he came. He talks about why it is he came. And as we talk about being a good soldier of Christ, as we talk about the fact we are in a war, my brothers and sisters, we are in a war. John 18, verse 37. He's standing before Pilate. He's, Pilate asks him, you're a king then, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate's response, what is truth? We are in a war. And we are fellow soldiers for Christ. Okay, we're fellow sailors, marines, soldiers, and airmen. For Christ. <laughs> to testify to the truth. 
And the truth is that God's plan, God's mission, his ultimate mission is to what? To glorify his name. You should think about that for a moment. You recall they asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, how should we pray? What was the first thing he said to pray for? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We celebrate Palm Sunday a couple months from now. I don't know how many of you will be here for that. Some of our chaplains will be here. Palm Sunday. Christ is coming in. As you recall the story, he's coming in, he's mounted on what? A donkey. donkey. A sign of the king coming. And his, his followers are worshiping him. Hallelujah. Praising his name. And the religious leaders at the time, they said what? Hey, tell your people to shut up. Tell them to be quiet. And Jesus says, I could tell them to be quiet. I could tell them to shut up. But even if I did, the very stones would cry out. Creation. Its mission and purpose is to glorify the name of God. You think about Psalm 23. How many of you have ever uttered the words from Psalm 23 just as an encouragement to yourself? The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He leadeth me beside. We oftentimes rush right past verse 3, don't we? Because we are so in need of his, of his arms to wrap around us. We are so in need of his love, of his healing, of his encouragement, that we forget. Why does he lead us beside still pastures? Why does he give us a place to eat in the very midst of our enemies? For his name's sake. For his name's sake. Hmm. For his name's sake. My brothers and sisters, hmm. as you think about what it means in this war, this war for truth, this war on truth, I challenge you to keep that foremost in your mind. The grand strategy of God, as a member of the military, we've got a grand strategy of which we have a little piece of. It works its way down from the top. The big man, the commander-in-chief says, this is my grand strategy. This is what the world will look like at the end of my tour as president. We call that a grand strategy, a strategic strategy. And then there's all these operations. We're in the midst of our own operations here on the continent. There's operations in Afghanistan, operations in Europe. And they're a little smaller, but they take the grand strategy and they kind of tailor it down for their particular area. And then there's tactical strategies that take place on the ground. Individual units, Horn of Africa, specific and they all link back to what? The grand strategy. Folks, the grand strategy of God is that all nations and people would glorify the name of God. And thank you, God, that he is long-suffering, not wishing any to perish. But we know the truth of Scripture is that some will. Our mission in this war on truth is to testify to the glory of God. And we do that, especially this time of Christmas, as a reminder at Easter, the ultimate name, the name above all names, is Jesus Christ. And by that name, and only that name, may we be saved. And all who call upon that name will be saved. So as we, as I challenge us, this idea of being a good soldier for Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you in every facet of your life to ask yourself, how am I glorifying the name of God and what I do, and what I say, and what I think through my job, by doing the best job I possibly can for Christ? Because we also, Scripture says, that you should do everything as if unto the Lord. It is a sweet-smelling sacrifice to Him, our worship, in part through our work. Our worship through our relationships with one another. This community of faith is a wonderful and refreshing place to come to. But we must go out these doors. And we must carry the name of Christ to everyone we come into contact with. The Great Commission says that as we go, we're supposed to share and we're supposed to teach. 
God's ultimate mission is to exalt His name. And we are called to support that mission with our own unique skill set. 